Hi there, everyone. It is Christy, and I want to welcome you to this pre recorded episode of Dealing uh, with the Content Inside the Social Construction of Reality by Berger and Luckman. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to go over the main points of their first chapter. Uh, so, part one Foundations of Knowledge in Everyday Life, part one The Reality of Everyday Life. And I know that this chapter and this book is very difficult um, and very hard for some people, and that's completely understandable. It's quite dense, but there are some really simple points that are actually not that complicated that we can pull out from this chapter. So my goal in this video is to help you wade, when you're wading through all the information and language and things that they bring up, what are the things that you really need to take away from this chapter? What are the useful practical things that we'll need later on? So I'm going to go over those, uh, at least my interpretation of what are the most important parts of this chapter that you should take away with you. And uh, and then, of course, you know, we I still in the Discord have to figure out some way of chatting or whatever else. I will also take pictures of my notes. There are three pages of notes, and I will upload them to the Discord. So you can see my notes if you can read them, uh, and they should also help with uh, understanding what the main points, at least as far as I am concerned, you know, you can have your own views uh, of this chapter are. So in terms of what uh, they they do in this chapter, they start to lay, lay down some of the foundations of almost like the necessary and sufficient conditions for having an everyday reality. And I kind of wish they would have organized the chapter along that because it would make things a lot easier to understand. Instead, they kind of... Um, they make a, a, an argument that proceeds along the course of the chapter, but what they don't do, and I wish they'd do, and I'm very obvious as a writer, so I tend to do this. In this chapter, I will do this, 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 and this. <laughs> you know? And then at the end of the chapter say, in this chapter, you've now learned this, this, and this. And it just helps the reader understand what things that they really should be paying attention to and what stuff is side information or context that helps you better understand the point. So I'm going to go more from my notes, but I'm going to try to follow along inside the, do uh, the document. And again, I'm not going to do more than 10% of the chapter in order to comply with fairly fair use requirements. So Berger and Luckman claim, and you can agree or not, but this is their argument, that everyday life presents itself as a reality that people interpret and is subjectively meaningful. So this is something that they want to assert is universal. We all, whatever our sort of social location is or whatever else, we all have an experience of reality that we consider our everyday life. And it is both sort of appears to us as objective. And it is also something that we have to interpret and give and we provide subjective meaning to. Um, and I think that's uh, da -da 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 -da. Yes, uh, the uh, I'm gonna go. Sorry, go ahead with this. I'm I already had pages on my yeah, everyday life presents itself. That's where we are, as a reality that has to be interpreted, and this everyday life is taken for granted as reality. So, um, and this is actually quite an important point to reflect on, that how the world appears to us initially, like as children, as we're socialized into our worldview, and even as we carry on into adult life, we sort of assume that the reality we perceive is an accurate reflection. We kind of take for granted the solidity and the facts, facticity, I think is a word they use a lot that I like, of our experiences as reality. So I think that also is important. People take for granted that their experience of reality is sort of real. And the other thing that they mention here that I think is important is that even though we consider our daily life or everyday life and external reality, it actually, um, most of it, quite a lot of it, in terms of our social reality, originates in thoughts and actions and is maintained by thoughts and actions as real. So every time we go out in our cars and we drive on the left or the right side of the road, regarding, depending on where we live, as long as we're complying by the law, we're reconstructing a, a reality. We are actually performing an act of reality by engaging in these actions. And our thoughts uh, also contribute to the perception of this reality and its maintenance as real. We don't always understand the role we play in creating our day-to-day -day life, in creating our reality through our unconscious or unreflective actions, but that is precisely what we are doing. Okay, um, common sense, yes. 
And this is also an important thing to consider when we think of the scope of what people perceive as reality. It's not just the physical colors and material objects, but uh, what people consider common sense reality oftentimes includes pre-scientific and or quasi-scientific interpretations of everyday life, and they take those for granted. So an example of this we can think of is someone who is raised with a concept of sin. And if sin is part of your worldview and your interpretations, that, you say, pre-scientific understanding will uh, color how you understand your reality. You might have causal attributions as to why some things happen because of Satan or whatever evil force in the world or someone being flawed because of sin. So the veracity of a belief or its nature does not necessarily rule it in or out in terms of people's perceptions of it as being real. So our common sense perception of reality can include a lot of not common sense kinds of things. All right, so that what I would say is like the first section of the chapter. I'm going to divide the section, this chapter up more clearly than they did because I need to in order to properly understand it. So just kind of cluster that part of inf the information together. I think it hangs together nicely. Now what we're going to do is we're going to shift our attention and we're going to look at the various components that underlie our experiences of reality and our engagement with it um, and, and how those what's the word I'm looking for, how those interactions or whatever else you want to say um, help shape or determine our experience of our reality. So uh, one of the things they bring up here in terms of a component for how people understand the reality of so everyday social life or everyday reality is that we have consciousness. So that is definitely a necessary <laughs> and sometimes a sufficient condition for the perception of reality, some level of consciousness. And what they want to say here about consciousness is that it intends or is directed toward objects. And that is that consciousness is directed not only at the external world, but also toward our internal subjective reality. So our consciousness, I mean, we are consciously aware of the external world and our internal world, but how, but our consciousness plays a role in both. So it's not as if our consciousness merely takes in information from the outer world. Our consciousness is an active part of our subjective um, inner life or inner reality. Now, as they say, uh, different objects present themselves to our consciousness as belonging to different spheres of reality. So again, we know that there's difference between people that I meet in my daily life and people I interact with in my dreams. My consciousness has intention towards an action directed toward dream actors, my dream extras that I interact with in my sleep. But, and that is part of my reality. But I understand that those people don't exist and don't, I don't interact with them in the same way I do with regular human, with, with people outside, when I'm awake, with the, you know, like outside the matrix or whatever else. Um, right, so we can both, you know, in our dreams, interact with people as if they were real. And then coming out of that dream state, understand that that was actually not reality. That was our conscious minds or our dream minds, right? And understand the difference. Um, we also, as they go on, understand that our world consists of multiple uh, kinds of realities. And I, I prefer the term, I, I, I wish they would have written different modes of reality rather than different um, multiple realities, because it sounds a little too multiverse. Um, I think modes of existence are maybe, but you know, they have their own way of talking. So let's see. Um, and amongst all of these perceptions of realities, the one that we experience right now, get up and I'm interacting with the physical world and I can interact with people and I'm reading things and I'm retaining the information. This experience of reality is considered the one that's the most real. So our dream reality, we understand, appears real at the time, but when we wake up, we can reflect back and go, actually, that wasn't real. Um, but this reality, as far as we know, is the real one. And this is the one that we spend most of our time in and we, we operate within. So understanding which one is, even though there are multiple ways of realities appearing to our consciousness, um, this one that we're talking about here, the everyday one, is sort of the par excellence. All right. Um, next, we talked about consciousness. 
In the next section, they're going to talk about how things appear to our minds. So everyday life appears to our conscious mind as, and this is important, an ordered reality. We come to the physical world with um, it already having the properties of being um, under the influence of gravity and physics. You know, like if we have a box of cereal and we shake it up, you know, the bigger parts will, if we don't crush it, fall to the bottom and the lower, uh, smaller parts will go to the top, right? Isn't that how it works? Actually, or is it the other way around? See, I don't know how physics works. But anyway, if we do these repeated experiments, we'll get them, we'll get the same outcomes over and over again. And so um, our our everyday waking life always appears to us effortlessly as an ordered reality that has prearranged patterns. And these patterns and orders appear independent of our minds. It looks like they've always been, you know, like I don't need to subjectively interact with rocks and pebbles in order for, oh no, it's all the small stuff would filter to the bottom, bottom, wouldn't it? I'm still thinking about how does physics work? Um, and, you know, how um, things will interact with the physical world. Like we, we have the consistency of experience. And so it feels very separate from us. Um, so just in terms of its appearance. First, it appears ordered. Next, it appears objectified. Um, we are born into societies where a language has already been developed. People have already imputed certain phonetic noises to represent like a candle. Candle, candle or Kerzen in German. Um, and this, uh, you know, we're born into the structure. Like these things have already mostly been determined, except for neologisms and stuff that come up. So um, this is another way of the world appearing ordered to us and objectified, independent. And then third, language continually provides us with the necessary objectification for our experience of the external world. And it posits the order within, these, within which these make sense. So uh, all of these things are given to us sort of as we're educated and socialized. And it also, um, we can also be, have, ask, um, attributions of meaning to various ways of ordering the world in a certain way. All right, so this is important. I just want to make sure I'm still, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 want, I had this sudden fear that I hadn't hit the record button and I've been talking for 12 minutes into empty space, but I, I see myself, so it's fine. Um, so, and, and this, is, this is the takeaway from this section, I think, that language marks the coordinates of my life in society and fills it with meaningful objects. Language is the way that we connect our experiences of the physical world and the way it presents itself to us as ordered and objective. Language reflects and reinforces that objective and ordered nature. And then um, this language also is the boundaries with which we describe our world and we assign meaning. All right. Now, if we move away from mind and we go into the physicality, in what ways are we physically connected to the material world in terms of how it helps us understand everyday reality? So they say we have a body, right? We have some sort of physical material presence and reality is organized for us around the here, meaning geographically, where are we located in space and the now. And they say here that, um, again, like with the appearance of uh, the reality that we are here with, right, not in our dream reality, it's presented as the realismus of my consciousness. This is the most real. My here and now is the most real experience of my conscious mind. I can remember the past. I can think about the future. But my here and now in my physical body is my most real form of being, as it were. Not being, but experiencing reality. So, um, and the reality I can impact is the one proximal, proximal to me. So their contention here is the everyday reality that I have the most influence over is the one that I am, um, is in the timeline I am in, like in, in my current moment and also in my location physically around me. Now, I understand where people might be like, well, what about social media and all this, this stuff? This book was also written in the 1960s. So things were a lot more limited there. And so not all of their 
conjecture or speculation or theorizing, depending on how you want to look at this, is going to represent, um, you know, the most modern outlooks. But they are at least making this effort of trying to delineate the necessary and sufficient conditions for an experience of everyday reality. Then when we understand that we have a material body and a perception in the here and now, um, also we then have to acknowledge, I have to move the page forward here because I, I think I've skipped some bits here. Um, the reality of everyday life further presents itself to me as an intersubjective world, a world that I share with others. And this intersubjectivity sharply differentiates everyday life from the realities of other realities that I am uh, conscious of. In fact, I cannot exist in my everyday life without continually interacting and communicating with others. So as much as we think about objective reality and my perceptions of it, there is also the component of intersubjectivity and intersubjects um, and inner communications and whatever else that is a, is a necessary component. If I lived on an island all by myself, um, I would not experience reality in the same way as someone who lived in a society. If I had no one to talk to, I would have no, I would have very little need for language. I would have very few opportunities to have, you know, a different perspective presented to me unless I was actively seeking them out. So to have a social, you know, to have a shared reality, you need more than one person is kind of the point that they're trying to make here. So when they go on to say this, um, I know others experience everyday reality as I do. I know there is an ongoing correspondence between my meaning and their meaning. Sometimes those things can differ, and this is where contestation arises, but just generally, like if we agree a car is called a car or an auto or whatever else we call it, um, that uh, is, is also part of our experience of daily life, and that we have what they, they deem this common sense knowledge, it's normal, self-evident routines of daily life. I'm not saying all of these things can't be contested, but they're just sort of, again, setting down the basic principles of how we experience everyday, ordinary life as we understand it to be. Um, da, 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 da. And, and then, yeah, oh, okay, this is, um, everyday life can be routine or it can have problems. Our everyday experience of reality can just go along smoothly or we can come into some sort of obstacle. And what they say is, as long as my routine continues without interruption, it's perceived as unproblematic. And when interruptions occur, People want to, they would speculate, integrate the problematic into the unproblematic. Now, there is a whole lot to unpack there that they don't, but when I was reading this, I was thinking about how a lot of, yeah, straight up, uh, like within um, white people, white people society in America, the existence of Aunt Jemima wasn't problematic to them. Like, it just didn't register on their radar. And, uh, you know, because they don't have any natural links I mean, maybe they do, maybe they have empathetic ones, but cultural ones, there's a lot of reasons that all that, that stuff gets whitewashed because of the dominant white culture. Um, and when that is then uh, brought up, the racist history of Aunt Jemima and all of the kind of problematic things around that image and that name, then what um, Berger and Luckman would say is once this tension arises, people want to find a way to make it unproblematic again. Now, they don't say how. We don't talk about that at this point. We could speculate here. One thing is to deny it's problematic. Keep it unproblematic by just saying it doesn't matter. That's one way of dealing with the problem. The other one is to reinvent it in order to make it unproblematic so that you don't have to think about Aunt Jemima every day. Um, so that is how experience of everyday life, kind of we bump into stuff that um, might challenge our perceptions or might become problematic. Um, I, again, it's not super well organized, this chapter, in my opinion, uh, having read it three times now. I mean, there's good ideas in here, but they're just not really specific, you know, in terms of signposting various what is important in each section. But another area they go into here is understanding that our experience of reality um, can appear as uh, different elements of life. So they talk about the role of the theater or the role of aesthetics in art, or the role of, the role of um, religious art. And these are experiences of reality that aren't exactly like our day-to-day -day reality. However, they are valid experiences. So our shared language 
that you have available within whatever languages you speak, you have available there to you in those languages um, the ability to objectify those more maybe um, it's not ephemeral there's a word I'm looking for that means not uh, ineffable uh, ineffable human experiences but we have because of the nature the object focused sort of um, permanent uh, there's a word they look they use, um, objectification of my experience is grounded in everyday life I have to translate the non-everyday experiences back into the paramount reality of everyday life. And they give the example of a quantum physicist who has an understanding in their mind of the, the uh, they've built a little a model of what the quantum realm might look like. But there's nothing in the quantum realm that we have appropriate language for. And so they end up having to describe something ineffable yet um, with language that seems very objectified. So that's um, basically linking between our struggle with an ineffable ex part of our real existence, our reality, and the limits of our language, the structures of the nature of our language to be objectif um, objectif um, objectification. <laughs> the I think almost last one, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the last point that they make about our experiences of everyday reality is that it is temporal in nature. It is There is linear time. We experience our reality as a past, a present, and a future. And we understand this to be quite a reliable, um, independent, but also influential force that shapes and determines our lives on a pretty regular basis. So they say that we, uh, because of our understanding of the temporal nature of our reality, this forces us to organize projects w um, that I share with others within a common time frame. And it also, they would speculate, again, I'm, I'm just here to try to translate I, you know, everything they're doing here I, into my understanding. It makes us, um, this understanding of temporality makes us aware of our own mortality. And they write here, only within this temporal structure does everyday life retain for me its accent of reality. And they give us an example. You, have, um, you check your clock or your watch to sort of re-enter the reality of everyday life. So um, like linking yourself to the artificial, artificial constructs of how we set up hours and things throughout the day. That helps us uh, be tethered to our experiences of reality. So in summary, which they don't do, but I really kind of wish they did, um, is to just go back over now the arguments that they made, the step-by-step -step process they got to the end of the chapter. So as a final reminder, they said uh, they first talked about an overview of what they meant by everyday reality and the way that it's perceived. Also a little bit about it being both independent and objective, but also capable of holding pre-scientific and quasi-scientific information as reality. Then they looked at the role of consciousness that we have as human beings in um, our perceptions of reality and of others within that reality, how that consciousness, how things appear to our mind, that was the next section, right? How it appears ordered, objectified, and that language is a means by which we communicate those um, that information and reinforce it. Then moving from consciousness and mind, we went into the physical body of one person and how our body helps order our experience of reality. Then we looked at how they looked at how our intersubjective experiences with other human bodies, with people with bodies, uh, is is necessary for our understanding of consciousness. Also, how our experience of everyday reality um, is either unproblematic or problematic. Ooh. Sorry, uh, when when we experience it in terms of its intersubjective nature or just its own subjective nature, we can also think about experience not only limited to the physical world but also ineffable um, forms of experience such as art or theater, um, also dreams, uh, reality. Even though it it sounds like we're talking about materiality, all of our experiences uh, within our reality count in terms of this book. Again, language will help structure or limit 
the ways in which we have to describe the ineffable. And then finally, it's the role of time, how temporality combined with our bodies and our consciousness frame our understanding of our, our like how we have to in- operate with others and also of our own mortality. I hope that this helped. <laughs> Again, I'll take pictures of my notes and I will leave them in the Discord if you can read them. And then the next bit would be either, well, if you haven't read the chapter yet, you can go back with these little signposts and read it or reread it. Um, otherwise, if you feel like, uh, you know, you have a different take on this, you can mention it in the Discord. I don't know if I'll be checking the comments of this video. So, uh, and then if you're quite keen, you can go on to the next chapter, which is entitled Social Interaction in Everyday Life. 25 minutes? Yeah, that sounds about right. All right, everyone. Thank you for stopping by. I hope this was helpful. Again, I'll be in the Discord. There's anything else? I don't think so. Um, I've been Christy. You've been awesome especially if you're trying to read this book for the first time and you're not like a sociologist by nature, congratulations, way to go. And then uh, until my next happy hour or the next book chapter, um, goodbye. For, yeah, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Time to say goodbye, Christy. Goodbye, Christy. I can't believe I just did that on my own show by myself. <laughs>